Hello, my name is Fareed Khan. I'm the founder of the anti-racism activist group Canadians United Against Hate and the director of advocacy and media relations for the Rohingya Human Rights Network. I'd like to welcome viewers to Diversity Dialogue, conversations with prominent people who work in areas of human rights and anti-racism. We're very fortunate today to have with us Valerie uh, PA, uh, founder and director of the International Observatory of Human Rights, a media NGO located in London in the United Kingdom, which focuses on human rights issues. Valerie is a graduate of the University of Glasgow with an MA in English and Film and Television. Welcome to Diversity Dialogue, uh, Valerie. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, before we begin, could you please explain to viewers what the IOHR does? Absolutely. Um, we're a small NGO. We're based in London. Um, when I founded it, I wanted an NGO which used media. That's my background. And when I, I say use media, I mean to advocate. So we have uh, we started the world's first, I think, human rights TV channel, um, which is a little web TV channel called IOHR TV. Um, we also have social media and our focus is on uh, minority groups and refugees. Um, press freedom, statelessness, counter extremism. And we also work on various projects. For example, we're launching a new project at the moment, which is AI and the impact of it in, in human rights. So we're, we're very diverse and we've got a, a small team here in London. Um, and then we work with groups around the world. So one of the things that I wanted to do, for example, um, with press freedom was to focus on the uh, protection of journalists. So here we are at the very end of, of 2020. And, and today um, I've been working on uh, a piece around one of the cameramen that we used in Ethiopia, uh, whose name is Kumera Jumeru, and he's just been arrested there. So it's, it's being able to immediately jump onto a story, but also try and do something with it. So the, the, the advocacy work that we do is trying to raise awareness of what's going on around the world and, and really try and see how we can, we can help the people um, who, who are suffering human rights violations through media. Wow, it seems you've uh, actually loaded your plate up with a lot of different things. Um, I've found that many of the issues relating to human rights violations, whether in the present day or in the past, uh, seem to be founded in feelings of hate, bigotry, or racism by one group towards another. Um, historically, part of the societal infrastructure which has helped to propagate these ideologies uh, includes news media and social media in, in the present day. So, for example, there is research which shows that in the aftermath of 9-11, the way that media framed the story of the terrorists resulted in, increase, in an increase in Islamophobia and hate crimes directed at Muslims, not just in the U.S., but in other Western countries. As someone who runs a media uh, organization, what do you think uh, anti-racism and human rights activists can do to pressure media to tell stories in ways that benefit the victimized communities rather than hurt them? I don't think it's about benefiting, I think it's about neutrality. So, you know, when you start to benefit, then you, you bring in a, a, a slant, which I don't think should be there. Um, you know, a lot of media stories that we see follow different agenda. And the whole point about authenticity in media is actually reporting what the story is. So in this instance, if you go back to 9-11, the story was that some extremists flew planes into um, some buildings and killed an awful lot of people, um, taking away the tags of um, Islamist or you know anything else. It, you know we we we've learned from then. So then it was new and it was different and it was just the world was in shock. But now we don't suddenly go you know a Christian uh, terrorist has been caught or anything else. So it's about taking off the labels and actually telling the new story and highlighting what's happening. It's not adding a bunch of extras, which in the end can end up damaging and, and really inflicting more harm on minorities if you keep hearing a minority group named when you're associating it with, with perhaps a terror story or, or something equally terrifying. Um, I, I, I find that, um, I, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that because for example, um, if there is an incident that involves, for example, an Arab or a Muslim, we see media organizations, the headlines basically include the ethnicity or the religion of that person, you know, as the top part of the story. Just recently, last week in Nashville, Tennessee, in the U.S., we had a white man 
who exploded a bomb in downtown uh, Nashville. Um, and yet in none of the headlines anywhere was there any reference to his ethnicity or his race or anything like that, which is the way it should be. But that doesn't seem to be the case uh, when we're talking about uh, any perpetrators of such um, uh, violent acts who are not white. So what is it in the media that needs to change for that to happen? But I think that's the point. I think you, you, you actually, we are agreeing because for me, it's to take off the labels full stop. So a man detonated a bomb and what was his motivation? So if his motivation was that he's a right-wing extremist that, that has affiliations to right-wing groups, then that's part of telling the story about why he's doing that. But then also, if he's dead, you're only guessing. So it's it, with the journalist, it's trying to piece together that information of what we actually know, not what we're guessing at just because of the color of his skin or the fact he had a t-shirt on with Snoopy. You know, I think it's it's really important to to really, as a media, or certainly from a human rights perspective, is to take off those labels and then actually try and find the facts. So it's about authentic news reporting. And, and I agree with you. I mean, I, we see it all over the world where it's it's the color or the ethnicity um, that is defining what's happened. It's not what's really the authentic news story that should be being reported. Um. We seem to be living through a time uh, where around the world, hate has resulted in the rise in human rights violations of minority communities. <clears throat> For example, the Rohingya, Uyghurs, Kashmiris, the LGBTQ community in Africa, to name a few. Do you think this means that we're entering or have entered a post-human rights era where the persecution and brutal oppression of minority communities are ignored by um, governments and particularly Western governments who claim to uh, be defenders of human rights in order to placate political and business interests at the international level? Um, I think there's just more visibility of it. I think there has always been hate crime and there's always been um, human rights abuses. We just have better ways of identifying when it's happening. So I think, for example, with the LGBTQ community, there's documented abuse for hundreds of years but only now are we able to kind of wrap edges around it and identify when it's happening. Um, I think a government certainly, once we have the language to do that, should be stepping up. We have legal frameworks, certainly in the West, to manage hate crime. And, uh, you know, where, where, for example, I know you do a lot of work with the Rohingya. And if you look at the way what has happened in, in that space, then there are international laws. We've seen um, attempts with, with the Gambia to take that through a legal uh, route through a court. You know, there, there are things that can be done. So I don't think that it's a new phenomenon we've moved on. I think it's always been there, but I think we now have the framework to do something about it. Whether Western governments choose to do something about it, they can't really hide behind ignorance anymore. No, that's absolutely true. And, and as a Canadian, one of the things that we have done is we've actually tried to pressure the Canadian government to live up to its international legal obligations. And, um, you know, we've seen other Western governments also speak about, you know, uh, at atrocities and say, no, this, you know, this is a violation of international law and human rights standards. But when it comes to actually taking the action that could accomplish the end, which is to stop these atrocities from happening, it seems those governments in the West who are the architects of the international legal order, they seem to be sitting on their hands and not doing anything other than, you know, making these PR statements. And, and uh, that's problematic. And I, I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, what do you think we can do to try and change that? Because um, all that we've been doing up until now doesn't seem to be having the effect that we want. I don't think we'll stop the atrocities happening. I think we can try and stop the next atrocities happening. So as long as people can do that and feel that they have impunity, then they'll continue. So from a Western perspective, um, you know, we've, we've seen the Majinsky Act coming in around the world. We've seen sanctions being put in place, um, but it really has to hurt. And, and it's, it, it, you know, unless we have very strong mechanisms and a collective multilateral approach, then unfortunately, regardless of, of 
you know, brave countries like the Gambia who are who have stepped up and have called genocide on Rohingya, um, then it it's it's almost impossible. What's the sanctions for for Myanmar to stop doing this the next time? You know, what's happened to them now? We're we're not seeing. Uh, really they, they have sanctions on them and individual sanctions are being placed um, across the world. But what's to stop? If I was a Rohingya refugee now, would I feel safe to return to, to Rakhine State? No, I wouldn't. So something is failing. And in terms of what do we do about it, I think we highlight it and, and you've done a huge amount in that area. And I think particularly trying to galvanize focus and, and to, to draw your government into action is, has been an amazing effort. But I think that on an international level, it really can't be down to, to one or two countries. That's the mechanism of the UN. And I think until we see much stronger leadership within the UN driving that forwards, then we're not going to succeed with one or two or six countries trying to move the dial. I think one of the things that uh, causes governments to listen, obviously, is um, when the public within their borders decide to speak up. We've seen that in various cases. So, for example, um, over this last year, when the uh, murder of George Floyd happened, it was shared on social media, it galvanized people, um, not just in the United States, but in countries around the world to speak up about racism and anti-Black racism. But Obviously, those sorts of moments in history don't happen all the time. So, you know, based on your experiences, what do you think that, you know, just average people, just members of the public should be doing to try and get their governments uh, and their politicians to pay attention to issues which um, people have literally bled and died uh, for and rights that a lot of people take for granted, but, you know, came at a very precious cost? I think, first of all, it's it's not all the same. So with something like George Floyd, a police officer kneeling on the neck of a man who's calling for air is, is wrong in every way. It doesn't matter about the color of his skin in the first place. So ultimately, the job to stop that sits entirely within the gift of the US government and entirely in the gift of, of underneath the layers underneath that. The fact that that's happening to a black man and probably hasn't happened very often to a white man says a lot about the racial inequalities of the states. And again, that's within the gift of the American government and, and various states across the government, ac across the United States to do something about that. If you were to see the same picture happening somewhere in Myanmar, then is that within the gift of the US government to do something about it? Well, yes, so they can as put pressure, they, they can put on sanctions, they can um, start to try and use political pressure. But I think that I, I would make this distinction. So from a public's perspective, the, the, the Black Lives Matter around the world has done a number of things. First of all, it's called out the immediate um, need to, to change police activities. I mean, no one should ever be kneeling on someone's neck, first of all, at a, at a tiny micro level. But then it's in the gift around the Western worlds to say change has to happen and we're watching and we can do something about it. We can, well, sadly, hopefully not in coronavirus, but after coronavirus, we, we can petition, we can march, we can ensure that we're watching that change is happening. The problem comes when it's not in the gift of an individual government. And this is where I, I think we should be Certainly, when we we advocate for people all over the world, and you know, I do a lot of work trying to to bring dual nationals out of prison in Iran. Um, the Iranian government isn't going to listen to a small voice in London, but what we can do is at least keep the pressure up um, on a global scale. I mean, there is a massive diaspora of Iranians around the world. There are countries, we, you know, we work with eleven different families who are being impacted right now by their their loved ones being in prison and being held as as hostage purely for a political gain. So keeping that, that pressure up, keeping those people alive and their names alive and, and knowing, you know, if I get a t into a taxi in London, then the cab driver will talk to me about Nazanin Zaghavi Ratcliffe. The fact that a cabbie here knows about human rights, he knows about Iran, he knows about what's going on, is, is a huge testament to, to 
Richard Ratcliffe and, and the campaign that he's managed to create to, to try and bring his wife out of prison. Um, and that sort of shows what individuals can do, but also what a collective global community can do as well. But again, it comes back to who can make the change. So, you know, what does Iran want to let these people go? And what do we, what pressures can we bring um, from, a, from a local level, but also on an international level? So how can we keep people alive? How can we stop people like Dr. Amadreza Dajali being um, executed? You know, he's a Swedish Iranian uh, academic. He's a disaster medicine specialist. You know, someone like that at the moment sits on death row tonight in Iran. So by keeping his name in the press, in the media, to, you know, it becomes a huge embarrassment if the Iranians decide that they do want to execute him, that, that they know that the impact on their, their international standing at a negotiation table is severely diminished by their actions. And I think that's really where you have to make the breaks, where, where change is in country and where international pressure can hopefully keep people alive in, in extreme circumstances. Um, since the spring, uh, since the George Floyd incident, We've seen massive demonstrations, as I mentioned, around the world. We've also seen a heightened awareness about issues of uh, racism in society and public dialogue about racism, civil liberties, and human rights in various uh, in various uh, Western countries. Um, but we've also still continued to see stories pop up um, in international media and social media about open racism against minority individuals and communities, including actions by police officers statements by right-wing and nationalist politicians and examples of systemic racism that have enabled and encouraged racist elements within society. What do you think this says about the state of Western society and culture when it comes to the issues of human rights, equality of citizenship, and the place of uh, minority communities within society? I think we're in, in, in dire need of change um, is what it says to me. So. Uh, I look around the world. I mean, in the UK, we have a big issue around citizenship stripping, for example. Um, now, you and I have both worked uh, in, in statelessness communities and, and trying to make a difference there. And the idea that uh, the British government, who has sat on the Human Rights Committee um, for many years, is actually currently stripping citizens by telling them that because they have in the case of someone like Shamima Begin, because they have ancestry in Bangladesh, that means that they've got the ability to have uh, another passport. So you're not from round here, you can go somewhere else. Now, if I had done what Shamima Begin has done, allegedly has done, then I'm a thousand years British, what are they going to do? Does that mean they would strip my citizenship or would I just be put in prison? You know, sorry, could, you just, could you just um, explain a little about who you're referring to? Of course, I'm so sorry. Um, so Shamima Begin is a, a British schoolgirl at the age of 15 who went to Syria with friends. She joined ISIS. Um, she became the, the so-called one of the brides of ISIS. And um, she was discovered in a camp by the uh, Times journalist, Anthony Lloyd, and was interviewed. Um, just on the point that she was about to give birth to a child in the refugee camp. Um, in that interview, she didn't really show much remorse about what had happened to her life. She was sort of in, in shock. Um, and from that interview, the British government decided that um, she was a, sympath a, a terrorist sympathizer. She had chosen to go to Syria and she had her citizenship stripped from her. Um, so she has become the poster child at the moment. There's a Supreme Court case that was brought at the beginning of uh, December, and we're still waiting to hear the outcome of that. But the case is really highlighting the fact that, for example, I'm using just this as an example, that the ability for the British government not to try and bring a case in the way that they might against someone in this country um, who has undertaken terrorist activities, the fact that their, their citizenship stripping a British citizen without explicitly highlighting charges or anything else, um, but because of the colour of her skin and the ethnicity of her family, saying that actually she could go somewhere else. So, I mean, I think for us, that's really highlighting one of the things that is, is most troubling 
in the societies that we're moving forwards. It's where governments are beginning to manipulate laws. And we've seen it in Poland, for example, we've seen it in Hungary. Um, we, you know, I do a lot of work uh, on press freedom in Turkey, where we've seen the rule of law being completely manipulated for, for po political gain. Um, and I think when you see governments using the rule of law to inflict human rights violations against their citizens, then as a society, we have a lot to, to work. Well, certainly as the, the, the NGO community has a lot of work to do. I think 2021 will, will hopefully give us the window to do that. Would you say that in cases like uh, Shamima Begum, that uh, this can be labeled as official government sanctioned racism and hate? Um, yes, I would. Because I'm not defending Shamima Begin as a potential terrorist. I think she has a case to answer for. And I think she needs, as a British citizen, to be brought to court, evidence to be placed, and for her to go through that process in the same way I would expect anyone else who has potentially caused or been part of a terrorist organization. But the fact that her citizenship has been stripped, which is basically saying, first of all, you're not from around here. Secondly, that we as a British government are going to make it somebody else's problem if we think, if we believe that you're a terrorist. Um, you know, that, that is racism. That doesn't happen with the far extreme right wing guy that, that you know, attacks a school or, or shoots a, an MP as, as happened a few years ago in this country with Joe Cox. So, you know, their citizenship is not being put on trial. Whereas someone like Shamima Begin, her citizenship is. So that has to be seen as a racist act. Um, just muted there. Um, one of the most controversial issues around human rights in a number of Western countries, including Canada and France, over the last number of years has been the issue of promoting secularism through laws which end up denying religious freedoms to Muslims specifically laws that force Muslim women to remove the hijab if they want to work in public institutions or receive public services. Uh, such laws uh, are often justified by political leaders saying uh, that a majority of the public favors them. Critics and human rights activists point out that political leaders who support such laws are caving into racist and prejudicial attitudes uh, of the majority for political gain. As the head of an organization that tells human rights stories from different parts of the world, could you give your thoughts on whether or not this is a trend and what you see as options on pushing back against such laws and protecting the religious freedoms of all religious minorities? Um, well, particularly on the, um, the case in France, um, if you go to our website, uh, which is www.observatoryihr.org, then um, my head of research has done a fantastic piece uh, a, a blog uh, specifically talking about the historical context of, of what's happened in France. And I, I, I'm pointing you to that because I think it's really important to look at the context to understand where countries like France, how they've come to that position. Because I think unless you understand the how and the why, then it's really difficult to start to address how do you begin to break that down. Um, and I think in France, if you were to flip that round and say that it's uh, a, the symbol of a cross, for example, then, you know, would it be the same rhetoric? So I understand the arguments and I understand the historical environment that, that France has, has created. And, and again, I'm using France as the example here. Um, you know, they, they have a, a historical background in being a secular society. But I think you know, our societies are, are, are very, very mixed now and, and the environment has changed. But I also think that it's important for balance. So for me, I live in the east end of London and I live in a borough which is defined as being the most diverse place on the planet. There are over 236 different dialects and languages spoken in my borough. And I see people of every ethnicity, every color, every shape, you know, I've got people are wearing every kind of clothing and everything else. It's, it's a pleasure to live here. And it's one of the reasons I do. And I think it's embracing that culture. The moment that you have 
that you your citizens begin to feel uncomfortable or separate because they're not understanding a culture then I think that's where the government's position is really trying to break down those barriers it's not saying I feel uncomfortable about going into that shop because I'm a woman or I feel uncomfortable um, because I, I don't want my children to to be part of of learning about different religions now we've worked with a lot of refugees and it's fascinating finding the listening to refugees landing in this country and and setting up home here and from their perspective what they see as being part of our culture as being very strange you know is it okay to go into a pub with your kids if you want to they want to go go to the loo or something you know there's there's all these these differences and i think a lot of this is just about dialogue and and not breaking down a society that says you know your children have to be molded in this this very secular way so I'm, I'm going a bit, bit off piece here on your, your questions, so forgive me. But I mean, what do you see in Canada? Coming, coming back to you, you, you live in one of the most diverse places on the, on the planet as well. Well, here in Canada, of course, you know, we've got an official policy of multiculturalism, but there's been pushback uh, on that for a number of years. And uh, in the province of Quebec, we have a government that has imposed a law very similar to what you have in France where um, they have said that secularism is the overriding um, you know, uh, issue of uh, government, that government cannot be seen to be uh, promoting a certain faith. And as a result of uh, trying to promote that, they basically targeted all visible minority religions, which means that if uh, you're a Muslim uh, woman or a Sikh and you cover your head as part of your faith, which is protected under Canada's constitution, but in the province of Quebec, this law says you can't work for the provincial government in certain um, in certain capacities like judges or police officers or teachers. Now this law is being challenged constitutionally, but in the meantime, lives are being disrupted. People are being dislocated until it works its way through the system. So, um, but it seems that this is not something unique to Canada. I mean, France, I mentioned France, of course, but these are things happening in other places as well, including you know, in, in different countries in Western Europe. And, and from your perspective, I think you've got a vantage point looking at this and the perspective and the work that you do that's very unique. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, I, I cannot see, I mean, I, it, it's about inclusivity of a community. When you start seeing communities being segregated because of religion or because of language or, you know, poverty levels or anything else, then something is is going to go wrong with that. And I think it's about balance. And, I, you know, I keep, we look at it all across the world. And I think that it's absolutely about understanding. And I think governments who try and behave the way France has, uh, sees the results of that. Now, I'm not defending an act of, of terrorism, as we saw with, with a French teacher being attacked because of, of what he was doing. But on the other hand, I also think that a French teacher who believes what he did by showing pictures which were offensive to a religious group um, to try and talk about press freedom, if you flipped that, had he started to show pictures of, of Nazi Germany, uh, Goebbels press, then how offensive would that have been to, to a different set of children? So I think it's about think, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and it's about being able to communicate what you're trying to express without it being offensive and, and, and trying to be inclusive. And I think it's that inclusivity that I'm seeing diminishing across Europe at the moment. And I think it's it's really important for us to to sort of focus on education and to really focus on letting education and teachers, but most of all the next generation, understand about that exclusivity. And particularly with in a world where the boundaries that we had as kids don't exist anymore. You've got Google and the internet and, and access to every single piece of information, but you're also being bombarded by by fake news and and every, you know hate hate speech online and everything else, then it's it's even more important to to create societies that have that that joined up approach and that ability to talk about 
why in, in Ontario do they believe that a woman showing her faith might be biased in any way in doing her job in the same way that would they stop a goth who dyed her hair black and wants to show her music tastes would they think that that has the same weight it, it, it's just insane so you know I, I think it's about being sensible and balanced and absolutely my word for 2021 is all about inclusivity and I think uh, we share that sentiment. Um, Valerie, uh, I've come to the end of my question. Is there anything else you would like to say just as a closing statement for the people who are watching this um, with regard to either the work that you do or the issue of human rights or fighting racism? All I would say is don't be silent. I think when, when hate speech and, and human rights abuse happens when people sit back and let it happen. So even in this, this COVID world that we live in, it's about making sure that the information and the knowledge that we're sharing and reading can be authenticated. It's, it's making sure that we stand up and call out when things need to change, but it's also putting ourselves in other people's shoes because 2021 is gonna be a very difficult year and it's, our world isn't gonna to return to the way it was for a very long time. If, if in fact it ever does. So all I would ask people is, is to think about what they can do, what we can all do to, to make things better for everyone. And ultimately it's about being kind to each other and thinking very hard before we start using language which might offend, but also think about who's around you and how to help those who are around you here, but also in a much wider community. So that, that would be my, my, my New Year's ask list for everyone, is to think about how to be kinder in 2021 and to speak up for those that just don't have a voice. Well, thank you, Valerie, and thank you to all those who are watching. Uh, my, I'm uh, Fareed Khan for Canadians United Against Hate, and we hope to uh, see you again when we uh, have our next interview. Thank you, and good day.